Today I want to talk about the healing covenant uh, just uh, to review really, really quickly. You know, there, there's no way that you can be in faith and fear at the same time. And we're living it right now in a, in a really strange environment where, where, where doubt, unbelief, and fear. I've never seen fear worldwide the way that I have now. Have you? I, I, in my lifetime, it's new for me. And, you know, again, I've got friends all over the world in ministry. And, and they're saying the same thing, that people are just choked with fear. And how many know God's not given us a spirit of fear? Uh, I started my life in a, with, uh, with an attitude of fear and, and had to overcome that. So I just want to encourage you, now is the time uh, to deal with fear. Um, fear cancels faith or faith cancels fear, right? So we talked about that in detail. And then uh, we, we took a, a, a week and we talked about the kinds of information that you're listening to. How many know if, you, if, you're, if we're smart, we'll do something to boost our faith in God to keep us well every single day? Now, I've said this um, just about all my spiritual life, and I'll be 45 in Jesus in September. But uh, I've said this, and I've been in ministry. This is my 40th year in ministry. I've said this over and over again. There'll never be a time in your life that you don't need faith in God for healing, either for yourself or for someone else. Is that true or false? If that's true, then it behooves us to prepare ourselves for the eventuality of needing healing, either for us or to pray for somebody else. And that means getting in the Word, right? Change the atmosphere of your life. And then uh, we talked briefly last week about taking responsibility for your, but for your health in Christ. Every, every battle and every victory, in every battle and every victory, there's a Godward side and a manward side. God has his part he plays. We have our part we play. Healing's just not, because it's available in Christ, it's not just going to drop on you without you, out you doing something, Right? You know, again, Ephesians 1 says we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, but that doesn't mean they automatically come. Listen, I know some believers that are beleaguered, they're down, they're out, things are tough, nothing's right, but you know what I found out? You've got to pursue God to get his best. It's not just going to drop on you automatically because we live in a fallen world. And the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, there are demonic forces. He called them principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. And they're trying to keep you from God. And they're trying to keep you from God's best. And you got to tell them in Jesus' name, get out of the way. And if you do that, God will start blessing your life. But you got to put your foot down, Right? Smith Wigglesworth said there was a little, uh, he told an illustration of what you've got to do with the devil. He said the one is a little chihuahua. Uh, you may or may not like chihuahuas. I have my opinions about them. But you know, they got big, ma- I think, you know, they're bigger on the inside than they are on the outside, right? So he said this little dog like a chihuahua, he, he, he saw this guy walking down the street in London. He's walking down the street and this little dog, yep, 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 yep. And the guy's walking and he's following him. And, the, and, and he said, you go on now, go on now. And he kept walking and, and he kept walking in the long, beep, 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 beep. and he was being nice. Now go on now, go back home now. And the dog wouldn't leave him alone. Finally, he said, the guy turned around and said, get. Said the guy, dog started yapping, yeah, 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 and ran home, tucked his tail between his legs. He's, and Smith Wigglesworth turned around to the people with him and said, that's the way you got to do with the devil. You can't be nice to the devil. Be nice to everybody else, but resist him with everything in you, right? So take, take responsibility for your health in Christ. Last week, we looked at seven reasons you can know that it's the will of God to heal you. Faith begins not with ability. You can know God can do anything. You know, we had a song we sang when I was a little boy. God can do anything, you know, anything, anything. Our God can do anything. And everybody just, whoa, 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 that's right. God can do anything. Well, you might be able to know that God can do everything, but, but you got to believe he wants to do it for you. You might know God can do everything, but you don't think he'll do it for you. See, faith begins where God's will is known. So we talked about that in fair detail. So can I boost your faith a little bit more today? Now, I don't know. This one I'm going to talk about today is really simple. It's not going to take me, pro- hopefully, not a long time. But, but it's profound. It's, uh, for me, it was life-changing when I found this out. And I think it will be for you as well. I want to talk about the healing covenant. 
Now, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, this is New Living Translation. But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. So, so here, the writer of Hebrews, which could be the Apostle Paul, is comparing old covenant with new covenant. And he says, the new covenant is a far better covenant with God because it's based on better promises, right? So, so question, there's a question when I read that. The question I have, if the new covenant is better than the old covenant, then should the new covenant at least contain what the old covenant had? A- and more, right? So, so if that's the case, then we need to examine even the covenant we'd make with God, that God made with his, his Old Testament people because that covenant, that promise he made to them, if it's true that we have a better covenant, Let's find out one thing specifically about healing he did for them. If you see this today, and I believe you will, because I pray for you, I believe that it's going to encourage you and help you know that God wants you well, he wants you healthy, he wants you strong, and he wants you to live until you're satisfied with life. I, I feel unction to say this again. I did a study because when I was young, I mentioned this last week or week before, when I was young, I had a fear of death, I fear of the fear that I would die of sickness, disease, or accident of some kind. And uh, then when I came to Jesus, that fear was assuaged, was uh, solved, and faith took its place and started walking and living by faith. And then, uh, but this thing about living a long time, because I always heard people say, well, 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 you know, might be your time. And then, you know, when I got on my first airplane flight, I heard somebody say, well, you want to be careful flying an airplane, because what if it's that pilot's time? And I said, well, if it's his time, then God will fly that plane if he has to, if it ain't my time. Or I'll get up and he'll show me what to do. One way or the other, we're going to put that thing on the ground, nonetheless. Right? But the whole idea was, you know, there's a time to live, time to die. Ecclesiastes 3, you know, time to live, time to die. And so people get the idea that there is an appointed time to die. Now, this is a shock. I did the study. And the shocking thing I found out was there is no appointed particular day. You're going to die that day. No, when God wrote all of the days of your life, said, well, you're going to live this amount of time, and that's it. No, you've got something to do with the length of time you live. You can shorten your days. Now, you can go through the scriptures. I don't have time to talk about it today. Or you, there's some things you can do that will prolong your days. But the underlying tone is God wants us to live until we're satisfied with life. Right? Well, you might not be able to say right unless you... I did the study. I'll tell you, when I did that study, it set me free. And then I I began to see clearly, I've got personal responsibility. If I want God's best, I have to give him my best. If I want God's best and I give him half, that doesn't count. If I want God's best and I give him a quarter, it doesn't work that way. Huh? Jesus said the sower sows the word and then, you know, some receive some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. And you know what he was saying? Some people will, will act on the word and, and, and do what God says 30% of the time. Some will do it 60% of the time, but rare is the person that says, I'm after Jesus 100% from the time my, my, uh, my, Eyes open into the time I hit the sack at night. There's a few, right? Now, I don't know about you, but I made a decision. I'm going to be one of those few. I'm after 100%. What about you? If you want, now, that was really meek and weak and lacking. Do you want God's best? Are you willing to give him your best? See, that's a big deal. That means when he speaks, we obey, Right? And we're in love with him. So anyway, healing covenant, here it is. Exodus 15, 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. Now look this word Shur up. The word Shur means wall. So, so it's the wilderness of Shur because the Egyptians put a wall on the eastern side of their country uh, that, that, that 
you know, came right up to an a, a, a open plain they call, uh, that the Bible calls a wilderness to keep marauders, uh, you know, uh, the enemy out, keep wild animals and such out, whatever. But anyway, it's called the wilderness of sure. And they went three days in the wilderness, found no water. The backdrop of this is the Israelites have been in Egypt for 400 years ever since Joseph brought them there during a horrible famine and, and he was uh, part of the hierarchy of the Egyptian government and they found favor and then lost favor with the Egyptians and became slaves and God through a series of 10 staggering miracles through the hands of Moses set the Israelites free. The Red Sea literally parted and congealed and they went through on dry ground. There's about two plus million people that are being spoken of here. That's the backdrop of this verse so three days after the Red Sea experience, they saw the hands of God, hand of God, the miracles through Moses. You can go through the first part of Exodus 2 through probably Exodus 11 or so, 12, and you can read about that. Nonetheless, they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. You know, you can't, uh, you can't live for so long without water, and then, then you go into where you're going. That's just the way it is. And so they were thirsty and uh, belly aching and crying and complaining. Now, when they came to Marah, everybody say Marah, or somebody, somebody, people say Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. And the word Marah means bitterness. Uh, now, therefore, the name of it was called Marah. Did some study on Marah. It's actually, a, it's actually an oasis in that particular area of Egypt and it still exists today and the water is still brackish it's full of so many chemicals it's bitter and so it's still that way today believe it or not and it says the people complained against Moses saying what shall we drink we can't drink the water what we gonna do verse 25 so he Moses cried out to the Lord the Lord showed him a tree when he cast it the tree into the water the waters were made sweet. Now, a lot of Bible common uh, expositors and those that comment on the scriptures refer to this tree as the cross of Jesus. The cross of Jesus applied to the bitter waters of life and sure make it sweet. Is that true or false? Uh, a lot of uh, analogies you can gather from that. Nonetheless, it says, when he cast it into the water, the waters were made sweet. Then he made a statute. Everybody say statute. And an ordinance, everybody say ordinance, for them, and there he tested them. Now, now this is a big deal. So, again, the backdrop is, you know, uh, the Israelites have been in Egypt for over 400 years. They were slaves. God just set them free. This is a new day, a new tone. Everybody's excited about, about not being a slave. Everybody's excited about the God of Israel because he just showed up. He just showed off real big in front of all of the gods of the Egypt, Egyptians. And so God's a real big God. And so, and so, and so God says there at the, the, the bitter waters that were made sweet by the type of the sacrifice of Jesus. God made a statute. God made an ordinance, a statute. We don't use that term very often. It's an authoritative decree an authoritative direction, an established rule, policy, or practice. So what do you get behind the word statute? It's something that will not change, right? It's a standard, you could say. Uh, then an ordinance for them. An ordinance is a verdict pronounced judicially, especially a sentence or formal decree, and I like this last part, something laid down or declared as fixed, or establish, this is not changing. So here, God's taking on, I want you to see it, God's taking on a new relationship with Israel. He, he's in the, he was in the backdrop. He was in the background. He saw them being persecuted. He saw them in slavery. He saw the harshness of the, of the Egyptians. Their gods were judged as they left. Now, he, now he's saying, I'm going to show them what I'm really like. They are my people. I have moved by my might and I have set them free and I want them to know something of my character. This is an established rule. It's a fixed practice. And so he said, and here in the next verse, God promises as a fixed practice, I want you to get it, the significance, as an established rule to be Israel's healer. Uh -uh, their physician. Now, the Egyptians had physicians, but God said, no, you don't understand. I want to be yours. 
When you got a problem, I want you to come to me. Is that good? And so he said this, Exodus 15, 26. Now this verse, I have used this verse. I have read this verse over and over and over. I call it meditating throughout my Christian life because it just helps me. And said, Exodus 15, 26, New King James Version. And said, God said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians for I am the Lord who heals you. You've got to break that down a little bit. The verbs, first of all, it says, I will put. You Wait, 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 wait. You mean God put? Sickness on the Egyptians, but he won't put sickness on the Israelites that have just left Egypt. No, the verbs there are not in the causative sense. They're in the permissive sense. You actually could read it this way. I will allow none of the diseases on you which I have allowed on the Egyptians. You get that? So again, God doesn't have any, we mentioned this last week when we talk about seven reasons that we know it's the will of God to heal. God doesn't have any sickness in heaven to give anybody. And, and God's not about ready to, to work in league with the devil. Now some people think he does, but I can tell you my God kicked Satan out of heaven. And Jesus speaking to the disciples said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. His name was Lucifer. It means light bearer, light one. Jesus saw him hit the dirt. He came to earth. He fell to earth. If God kicked him out of heaven, do you think he's going? And then a third of the angels listened to him. He was a gossiper, a conniver, a liar, a cheat, a thief. That's why if, if, if you're friends with a gossip, you got problems. A third of the angels, I bet throughout the eons of time since that happened, they thought, Man, I sure wish I hadn't listened to Lucifer. Daggum. I caught wind that God's going to chain us up one day. In fact, they did. some of them did get chained up. He said, not only that, but I caught wind of the fact that, jeez, uh, jeez Louise, we're going to be in this lake, going to burn forever. Instead of being in the glory of God, we're going to be in the flame of a furnace for eternity. What, how terrible. What have I done? Can you imagine those angels? Nonetheless, there is no sickness or illness in heaven. God doesn't work in league with Satan. He kicked him out. God doesn't have any sickness. So again, I will allow none of these. Why did it say I will allow none of these diseases? God will allow in your life what you allow. God can't go against your will. I don't want to be healed. Well, you won't be. I don't want to be blessed. Well, you won't be. I don't want to have good relationships. I want to be a stinker. Well, you will be. I don't want to have an easy life. I want to have problems. Well, you have a boatload. <laughs> right? Because you separate yourself from the Father with your choices. And guess what? You get to pay the price. Now, I've been in ministry again since 1981. It's a deep price some people pray to be out of the will of God. You know that? And sometimes you get so far, and God just says, well, if that's the way you want it to be, that's the way it'll be. And God can do nothing until we make changes. So later on down in the notes, but Deuteronomy 30, choose you this day whom you'll serve. Life, death, blessing, cursing. Can you imagine some people being... Self-centered enough to choose cursing, choose death. Young people, listen. We choose life or death with our attitudes. First of all, with attitude towards mom and daddy. Yes or no? We choose life or death with who we hang out with. Right? Right? J. Oswald Sanders in his book, Spiritual Leadership. I'm just idling my motor again a minute. Can we do that? I'm feeling something. J. Oswald Sanders in his book, Spiritual Leadership. I think it's copyright 1962. I read it. I read it at least once a year. He said, the person you are five years from now will be determined by the books you read and the friends 
you entertain. So some people are messed up because they won't change their friends. Huh? Some people push the blessing of God away because they want both worlds. I think the adage is they want their cake and eat it too. I, I don't know what that means. You go eat the whole cake? What is that? Anyway, if you want God's best, there's some things you've got to let go. Is that true? I'll tell you, I'm wandering around here. I feel it. When I came to Jesus, I had friends in my life that honestly, they were my friends at church. That means they were my friends prior to kindergarten, prior to grade one. I knew these guys. They were my friends. I could name their names today. When I came to Jesus, almost 18 years old, they didn't want, they laughed at me. Some of them did. Other ones just kind of looked at me like, are you serious? You, Mitch Horton, the Mitch Horton I've known all my life? Yup, yup, the Mitch Horton you've known all your life. You're a Jesus freak, man? No, I just love Jesus. I've changed. I'm not a freak. You can call me what you want. But they made a choice. I'm not going to quit smoking reefer. I'm not going to stop lusting after girls. I'm not going to start, stop drinking and lying and cheating and stealing. I noticed that most of these guys, I'm, I'm thinking right now, I got to wait a minute, let's think, let's think. I don't know one that's alive today. I'm a young man. But they're not here on earth. My best friend when I was a kid took his life. The guy that gave me drugs for the first time in the ninth grade when I was 14, he spent his life in the penitentiary. The last time I saw him, he was living with mama and daddy. Retired mama and daddy. He was in his late 50s. Three years ago, I was on, the, on a mission trip somewhere and I found out through Facebook that he died. You know that could have been me? You ever think that way? When I'm speaking, sometimes there's this thing that comes on me and I can tell. I don't know if you're in the room. It seems like you are. You better change your friends, friend, or you're going to have a hard time. I was out in the garden with my daddy. <clears throat> and my daddy, when we, and I had to hoe weeds in the garden. That's one of the things I couldn't stand to do. He made me hoe weeds. We had 36 rows of long, not little, long rows of vegetables in my garden. 36. Yeah, I counted them a lot. <laughs> 36 rows of vegetables too. You know. 36 rows of vegetables. And then 29 rows of vegetables. So, but while I'm out there, sometimes he's out there and he's hoeing with me. And he was always, now this is, maybe I shouldn't say this about, he was always pontificating. That means he was showing his, sharing his knowledge on all kinds of subjects. And he would just talk to me about life. He'd talk to me about my friends and he would give me anecdotes of things that have happened, things that this and that and the other. He was always talking to me about my friends. Mitch, you need to watch your friends. You need to watch what you do. And then he would always say, Mitch, you got to work hard in life. You won't have anything. I mean, no, you need a daddy like that. And you need a mama like that. But he showed me that I have responsibility in life. And that life doesn't come easy nor automatically. Now, see, Christians think, well, I'm a Christian. And so things are just going to be wonderful. No, they're not. Hell's coming. You're to, he's going he's to find your address, your email account. He's going to find your phone number to text you. The devil's going to try to land at lunch. He's going to try to eat your supper, kind of wake you up at night, try to keep you from everything that's right. And you've got to be willing to say no. And you've got to have nuts, enough guts to say no when everybody laughs at you. Friends. 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 person I am five years from now is determined by the books I read and the friends I entertain. You need to watch what you listen to. Huh? So you can't be a Christian by coming to church on Sunday morning. It takes more than that. 
Yes or no? Just because you hear me means absolutely nothing. No, 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 no. The difference is going to be what happens when you leave here. If you'll do the right thing today and get up in the morning and say, I'm going to do the right thing today and get up Tuesday, I'm going to do the right thing today. Wednesday, by the grace of God, I'm going to do the right thing today. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you come back next Sunday and say, let's go. What you got to say? But if you think you're going to ride my coattails to heaven, I might look around and you're not back there anywhere. I don't know why I'm saying all that. That's not even my message. No, God doesn't have any sickness in heaven, right? We have responsibility. I will allow none of the diseases on you which I've brought on the Egyptians for I am the Lord who healed you. So bottom line, there's some people here. You need to change your friendships. I'm saying there's some adults here. It's, it's hindering your life in God. God wants you to aggress. You can't go forward by looking backwards all the time. And your friends are having you look at back, look backwards. Look at yourself. Look at what you were. Look at what you used to be. Look at the quagmire of junk you were involved in. And they're reminding you constantly. My friends in my yesteryear wouldn't even know Mitch Horton today because I isn't the same person. I know that's not correct English, but you get it. Jesus changed my life. Jesus wasn't accepted in his own hometown. That's Joseph's son. That's a carpenter shop man. Huh. And he can make a, he, he can make a good door frame. He can make a good table. What's he doing preaching? Who is he? People won't accept the new life you have. And those that won't, leave them alone. Now, and I'm not saying be crass and angry and mean. I'm just saying don't fellowship with them and have lunch with them every day at noon. How many hear me? And then if you do have lunch with them, don't don't let them talk about their drinking and their sex and their mess and their junk. You talk about Jesus. That's all I did. And my friend said, well, you know, if I'm going to hang out with Jesus, I got to, I got to, I got to hang out with, if I'm going to hang out with Mitz, then I got to hang out with this Jesus stuff. And I believe I don't want to hear about Jesus today. So I'm not going to accept Mitch's offer to lunch. That's what happened. You get it? But you're still kind. I still made contact. still loved them. Right? How many get it? For I am the Lord who heals you. Everybody say, I am the Lord. Am the, Lord. the uh, Hebrew word there is Jehovah. Jehovah is the self-existent one who reveals himself. Uh, throughout the Bible, often when you see the word Lord, Jehovah. I think Yahweh is a derivative of that word. Jehovah. That means the covenant-keeping God who reveals himself. The standard-bearer. The standard-maker. I am who I am. So God said, I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord your physician. When he said, I'm the Lord your physician, they looked up. Whoa. We know about the Egyptian doctors. But God said, you're going to be my physician. That's what he said. He spoke this at the very beginning of their journey into uh, uh, towards the promised land. Right? God established some facts. It's more than a passing promise. It was to be a standard, a statute, an ordinance. And he wanted them to obey him. And and if they obey him, he basically said, I'll just, I'll, I'll take care of you physically. If you'll give your heart to me, I'll make sure the whole apparatus that, uh, that, that you call you is okay. Huh? So the only stipulation was, if you obey my commands, if you do what I said. He's basically saying, you do what I told you to do, and I'll do the rest. Is that good? So, so that's what God said to them. <laughs> you know, you do what I told you to do, I'll do the rest. Now, now I want to get in the weeds here a second. God gave Israel, listen, civil law. He gave them relational laws. He gave them moral laws. That if they obeyed them, they would keep them, those laws would keep them healthy. See, we live in a fallen world. God knew that. So when God made the covenant with Israel uh, after their exodus from Egypt, uh, he let them know, if you'll just obey my commands. Now, what do you mean, obey his commands? Now, here is a commentary I have. It's an 18-volume set in the Old Testament. It's called Understanding the Bible Commentary Series. And listen to what he said. The Lord's concern for health and healing 
is in 613 Sinai laws and it's extensive. And then I I put this in the notes because I want you to see it. Exodus chapter 19 through Numbers chapter 10 verse 10 contains all of the laws when God said, if you keep my commandments, specifically it's right there. Now you can go home and read that, take you a while. Exodus, Leviticus, and then partly through Numbers. You'll get, you'll get what he said to them. And then this guy says, community order in itself is a health issue. Keeping the, commen- the Ten Commandments such as you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, deeply reduces violent crime in any community. The Sinai laws are also full of legal procedures with extensive instruction on how to maintain a just court, establishing a system of rule by law rather than by force. The laws also address medical concerns, including quarantine for contagious diseases, washing requirements for those who handle corpses, which wasn't done in Europe until the 19th century. Wow. The laws governing sexuality provided for the possibility that sexually transmitted diseases will be non-existent. Do you know sexually transmitted diseases are at an all-time high in the United States of America today? You know why? We've forgotten the law of God. You forget the law of God, you're going to pay a price, right? Then Life Application Study Bible. This is a study Bible that I totally enjoy. It's not going to be true that this is my shortest message. <laughs> the Life Application Study Bible, God promised, and this is the note on Exodus 15, 25. God promised that if the people obeyed him, They would not suffer from the diseases that plagued the Egyptians. Little did they know that many of the moral laws he later gave them were designed to keep them free from sickness. For example, following God's laws against prostitution would keep them free from venereal disease. You know, a lot of Americans act like prostitutes today. That's both male and female, by the way. Don't hang it on the women, men too. Is that true? You wonder why we're having all the problems we're having. It's going to get worse unless we change, by the way. God's laws for us are often designed to keep us from harm. (laughs) Men and women are complex beings. Our physical, emotional, and spiritual lives are intertwined. Modern medicine is now acknowledging what these laws assumed. If we want God to care for us, we need to submit to his directions for living. Is that good or not? I thought that was all. So but God just basically said, you do your part, I do my part. Right? Or he, you know what he really said? Now this, I got to, this is a play on words. I will heal you supernaturally. Now you think that's all God, but look at the word supernatural. Hmm. You could say supernatural, God's saying, I will pour my super on your natural. I I will pour my power on what you give me to pour it on. I will pour my power on your obedience. If you do what I say, you'll get my power. You want supernatural? You do your natural. Super means above. Above the natural. Is that good? Man, that makes me think. Does it make you think? So God said to the Israelites, if you just obey what I told you, I'm going to be talking to Moses on Mount Sinai here in a little while. If you listen to what he says and keep keep that stuff, I'll keep you healthy. I'll pour out my power on what you give me. Now there's a New Testament parallel here, Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised up Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. There's a promise that not only is the Holy, Holy Spirit's no longer in man-made places. Now the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And he said, if the Holy Spirit lives in you, he will quicken, bring to life, empower your physical body. How many are acting on that one? So again, he pours his spirit out. He puts his super on our natural. Am I loving him with all my heart, soul, mind, strength? And I'm, am I giving Jesus something to pour out his ability on? That's the question, right? Philip's translation of this, Romans 8, 11, Nevertheless, once the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives within you, he will, by the same spirit, bring to your whole being new strength, new vitality. Isn't that good? 
So if we're wise, we're going to learn, we're going to learn number one, to obey the word of God. Do what God says in his word. Love people, forgive people. How many know your internal person uh, determines what happens to your external person? You can't hold on to anger, unforgiveness, offense, because it produces all kinds of internal pressures and expect to walk in physical health. It doesn't work that way. Then if you don't discipline yourself, Proverbs says, put a knife to your throat. If you be a person given to appetite, put that stinking fork down. That's Horton translation. I was in uh, Ethiopia. Everybody okay? I was in Ethiopia. This is, man, a dozen years ago. We had an emergency room physician from Texas with us in our entourage. We were going to help people medically in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And I think we went on down into the bush country. And, uh, and this doctor physician went with us. And I really enjoyed this man. He had more words. He talked more than me. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, right, thank you. Come on. He had a lot to say. And you know, it was really interesting to listen to it. Uh, I guess emergency room physicians are interesting anyway because they got to be ready for any eventuality, anything that comes in, you know. So we were sitting at the table one day eating breakfast and I had my, you know, they, they make eggs interesting in Ethiopia. Um, the, the edges of them are hard and fried. When you talk about fried egg, it's a fried egg. And it kind of reminds you of the tires on your car. I won't go any further. So I'm eating my eggs and, and my piece of brittle toast. And he said, well, when it comes to health, you can break it down in three ways. And boy, my, you know, you ever had a dog when you say, hey, you. My ears just went right towards him. He said, when it comes to health, break it down in three ways. Break it down to what you eat. Secondly, how you exercise. Thirdly, family background. Genetics. He said, a third of it, you, you're not going to change that. That's your genetics. But two-thirds of it, that's you. You're responsible. You know what? I never forgot what he said. And I thought, that's really, really good. So, so, so I just want you to know, God wants to keep you healthy and well. If you compare Exodus 15, 26 to today, God would basically say to us, I have given you my word I have given you my promises. I have placed inside of you the Holy Spirit who will show you things to come. He will take of what is mine and will show it to you, Jesus said in John chapter 16. He said, I will, I'll, I'll, Jesus will reveal me to you. I'll talk to you about your future. So you know what I found out that means? When I was 22 years of age, I was minding my own business, feeling lazy and lethargic. You ever felt that way? And I was only 22. You shouldn't feel that way at 22, but I did. I had been jogging, but I had stopped. And I heard the Lord say, Mitch, I want you to exercise. To exercise, I want you to jog. And I did for 33 years. Then when I was 54, he spoke to me in September of 2012. And he said, Mitch, I want you to start riding a bike. What do you mean riding a bike? A motorbike? No, no, one you pedal. Really? Uh-huh. So I went and bought me a nice road, well, actually a mountain bike, then a road bike and started doing it. I've been doing that ever since. Now I walk and now I ride my bike a long way. And you know, God told me to do that. See, see, why did I do that? Because the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Now, why did he speak to me? Do you think he has my best interest in, at heart? He spoke to me because I probably wouldn't have made the commitment to do what I did in my life if he hadn't spoke to me. How many hear what I said? Then over the years, over the years, he's dealt with me about the food. How many like food? There's certain kind of foods that you ought not like, but you really like. Particularly us Americans, right? So he dealt with me about food and he encouraged me. Mitch, you need to read up on food. In 2004, I was on the way to India. My appendix burst. And I spent nine days in a hospital in Fulton, Georgia, which is a suburb of Atlanta. Came back, I'd lost 20 pounds. I was gaunt. And, uh, but inside of me, I knew intuitively, change your diet. Now, I don't know what caused. I think the devil, I don't know what caused my appendix to, to do what it did, but it did. Maybe if you're a physician, you come and tell me after the service. Nonetheless, 
Nonetheless, I knew intuitively, Mitch, you need to change your diet. I want you to change your diet. I, so, so what did I do with that? See, that's Holy Spirit speaking to me. And I said, well, what, what kind of food do I need to eat? I didn't know. I said, I like French fries. I like hamburgers. I like, I like milkshakes. I like fried chicken. I like, you know, my mama fed me fried chicken a lot. I like roast beef and ham. <sighs> fried food's good. Go to the fair. Let's get us a piece of fried turkey leg, right? So 15, 15 books. I read 15 books on, on food and found out what food is good and what food isn't good. And the Holy Spirit said, I want you to take stuff that's good, start eating that mostly. You can splurge every now and then, but mostly eat the good stuff. And I had to change a lot of, of my diet, a lot. I don't mean a little. I had to revolutionize me. Now, you know, I didn't ask anybody else. I didn't ask Susan to do that. I did it. Then I read a book. One of the books I read was What the Bible Says About Healthy Living by Dr. Rex Russell. And in that book, he was a doctor, and that book is still available on Amazon. I guess he needs to give me some proceeds to that, help pay for our building. (laughs) What the Bible Says About Healthy Living. And he basically said three things to know about eating. Number one, eat only what God says is food. That's real good. There's a lot of things you eat you ought not eat. No, no healthy content in it. It just tastes good. Eat it, secondly, in its most natural form possible. Third, most difficult, eat it in moderation. That was good. That was a good idea. It took me a while to incorporate that. And still every now and then I got to splurge. But I'm just saying that what God said in Exodus 15, 26, I am the Lord, your physician. He told them to obey the commands. You will find that if you'll listen to God about your, your, your physical body, he'll talk to you about things you need to change. Question, how many times has God spoken about what you need to change? You just sat there inert. Ain't going to do that today. Well, what are you waiting on? Do you need to wait? Till a heart attack comes? I know that's tough, right? Do you need to wait till some malady comes because you're malnourished because you're eating the wrong things and you don't have a hunger for the things that God said is food? I said all that because, you know, I'm a pastor and I love people, but I intuitively know many times when I'm ministering to people, laying hands on the sick, I can tell this person needs to change their lifestyle. Us Americans, we do not value rest. Maybe we value rest too much. I don't know. It could be both extremes. God said rest one day a week, seven or eight hours a night. If you don't, you're going to have problems. You're going to break down. Right? And then a lot of people, listen, people from other countries love to come to America because, man, we got some really good fried stuff. And you got to say, that fast food is amazing, God. You think, "Mm, that, that tastes so good. That's so bad for me, but that tastes so good. So you got to figure out how to live life in a healthy way. Guess see, God speaks to me. Somebody gives me a piece of fried chicken. Guess what I do? I peel all the skin off of it. He said, I do. Waste that chicken. But see, I'm planning on being here when I'm 85. Because Exodus 15, 26 said, if you diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, And give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will allow none of these diseases on you which I've brought on people that don't know me for I am the Lord your physician. And you know what? If my physician's talking to me, I'm ready to listen. So I know we got Mama's Day dinner and you're probably going to eat some fried chicken. I don't know. (laughs) Or you're going to be like, I love the meat lover's pizza. Yeah. Just bring it all on. Whatever, I don't care. Listen to God about your diet and do what you need to do with your physical body and God will place his super on the natural you provide him. He can only bless you as far as you let him. Bottom line of this, God promised to be Jehovah Rapha. Everybody say Jehovah Rapha. The Lord, our physician. He did that for the Israelites. He'll do it for us. I noticed Psalm 105, 37. In fact, you read the rest of my notes. I'm not gonna read anymore. 
God promised to be Israel's physician. He promised to keep them. There's two and a half million people. Psalm 105, 37, I almost read, he brought them forth with silver and gold and there was no feeble person among their tribes. He's talking about uh, the number of people the size of Charlotte, North Carolina. That's a lot of folk. Would you say? There wasn't one feeble. If God could do it under the old covenant, could he do it for you? Could he keep you well? Question, what do you need to change? What natural do you need to change for God to pour his super on? See, we talk about divine healing. We want it all to be God and we forget our part. And then we wonder why it doesn't work. Yes or no? You can't violate the rules and get the best. You're not going to be the fastest runner. In fact, I, we had a run, I, got, I got talk on me today. I've just violated what I said. This is the longest message. I, we had a, 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 what do you call it? Uh, international runner, what do you call it? Olympic runner in our church 20 years ago. You know what he told me? He told me his kind of diet. He was a slender. Boy, that boy could run. And he said, I even shaved my legs. I said, Jesus help that man. <laughs> See, hair would slow him down. I'm just saying he paid a price. Athletes pay a price. If you're good, you pay a price. If you want health, you got part to play. So what natural are you providing for God to pour his super on? How many want God to be Jehovah Rapha to you? Now you hopefully you do, you got a physician. What about God being the great physician for you?